You're listening to the summary of the interview. For a link to the full-length episode, please check the description below. Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. Before we get started, I've been recording these interviews next to my day job and I will definitely continue to do so and release about an episode a month. But at the same time, I would love to take this further, share more interviews. There are many more stories to share on investing in regenerative food and agriculture. More depth, improve the quality, maybe even doing some video series. So I started a Patreon community, which makes it easy to support creators like myself. If these podcasts have been of value to you, and if you have the means, I invite you to support me and make this happen. For more information, please find the link to my Patreon account in the description below. And now, without further ado, the interview. Enjoy! Today, I'm interviewing Sean Kidney, co-founder of the Climate Bonds Initiative, an international investor-focused non-for-profit. They are the only organization working solely on mobilizing the 100 trillion, yes, that's a T, bond market for the climate for climate change solutions. Welcome, Sean. It's a, it is a U-turn. It is no longer a right angle turn because of the extent to which emissions have gone up in the last 30 years. We've put in more CO2 into the atmosphere in the last 30 years than the previous 150 years, while we've been talking about it, of course. So that's what we're faced with. Now, if you need to make this kind of change in an economy and a planet and society, there are large capital needs. It is a very high capex path. Take solar, low opex, high capex. That means a lot of capital up front. That means interest rates are critical for these investments. So bond markets are about $100 trillion outstanding globally. Equity markets are $60 trillion. Gives you a flavor difference. Bond markets are pension funds, insurance, government bodies, banks. These are different types of investors to equity investors a lot of the time. They tend not to be watching the stock, the S&P every day, especially amongst the institutional investors that have a long-term appetite, pension funds and insurance funds. There are a lot of buy and hold investors. Now, if you're trying to do a CapEx investment with a, with a long return on investment profile, this is the perfect investor class for you. And we need to get them into the game. At the moment, then only marginally exposed to what I'd call solution sectors. And in the sectors that need to become solution sectors, or we need to change practices, they're not largely aware of what's involved. In other words, they can't differentiate between a water utility that is doing uh, capital investment, which is climate ready versus capital investment, which is not climate ready and frankly might fail anyway, as it becomes a credit risk because of the weather volatility we're going into, the rainfall volatility. We, we, we can't afford a niche market here. We have to be able to engage the mainstream portfolio managers around the world. So these bonds walk and talk like an ordinary bond, similar yield, similar coupon. The distinguishing feature is a promise by the issuer, governed by an international framework, to allocate the proceeds to qualifying investments. We'll come back to qualifying investments later. And now we've got about $600 billion outstanding of these globally and a rapidly growing market. Can you give a short overview of where we are in terms of climate bonds and, and land use and agriculture? Well, well, clearly from a climate perspective, the agriculture sector is, is, is so important. In Europe, agriculture is the f largest source of greenhouse gas emissions, for example. Uh, working with the agricultural sector is a vital thing. Now, there are many things to be done with direct investment. We're not going to stop deforestation by investing in a forest. There are many attempts to do red two bonds and so on, but there's, the cash flows aren't there. There, we have to look at the economic development of the society around 
the natural capital assets and how do we make those richer and have a different economic path than the destruction of capital assets. That's the challenge. I'm separating out the bond issuance from the environmental challenge first. The, f the first thing to do is to identify activities that achieve our outcome. Once you've done that, then you look at the potential for bond issuance in an area. Agriculture sector will always be relatively small in bond issuance. The big sectors will be infrastructure and buildings and, and energy. But it's critically important from an emissions perspective. So what I'm trying to say is that preservation of national capital is one. The increase in sequestration of soils and the regrowth of forests is another. As you would know more than most, the potential for soil sequestration is huge. The changing of practices to reduce emissions at a farm level is also important. In the bond space, you need to be a reasonably large institution. That means a government, a bank or a corporation to be able to do this. And then the money trickles down through their processes to smallest landholders or whatever. You're not going to be a coffee farmer in Ghana and be able to issue a bond realistically. But you might get a green loan from a microfinance company who is able to issue a bond to refinance its portfolio of loans. One is the first thing is carbon, measuring and improving carbon stocks. If people can show evidence that they're doing that, bingo, that's going to be part of the solution. However, that's very difficult, not happening very often. So what we've ended up doing is having a basket of practices which are relatively short term in nature, but are seen to be consistent with improving carbon stocks. You know, zero tilling agriculture, for example, as you see from open plough. In Europe, if people can show that they are using that basket of practices, which are effectively proxies for the for activities that are or descriptions of activities that will improve carbon stocks, then that will count for the taxonomy. In other words, they'll be able to get access to green loans. If they're a large agricultural organization, they can do green bonds. That's how we tackle it. It's very early days. Well, well my, my point more was that we need to look at resilience. Resilience is actually more than just resilience against weather. It's about our ecosystem resilience. You know, complex systems, if they're hollowed out, collapse quickly and don't recover. We have hollowed out our global ecosystems. We need to work to make them more resilient by improving their biodiversity, by improving their ability to be able to respond to extreme climatic shocks and weather shocks we're going to have. That's essentially it. One of those issues is the use of artificial substances. We know that when you release a lot of antibiotics into the into the ecosystem, all sorts of changes happen. And I think it, it, it comes back nicely to the point of the need of transition finance because these farmers, these land users, they can get off these, these substances for the most part and in some cases even completely, but they need through that, that phase of, some people say five, some people say 10 years, some people say three, depends on the land, of course, what has been used before, but it, it, they need to, to be helped and, and actually climate bonds at the large, large scale or transition finance on the more local scale is needed for many to, to go through the path of, uh, of, of a number of years of getting off the drugs and basically re revitalizing the land or actually making it adaptive again or making it actually alive again. What we're working around globally is to make those loans cheaper. With development banks providing, providing credit support, with governments providing regulatory support, the lending to the green sector will be materially cheaper than lending to non-green sectors. So it'll be a direct financial incentive. Now you might be a farmer in somewhere like Italy and you're concerned about these issues, but you're trapped because you try to raise money and run something in a marginal in a marginal way. You'll be able to get cheaper capital from UniCredit because it's green. That's where we're going on this. And you'll see that unfolding. You just listen to the summary of the interview. For the full length interview, please find the link in the description below. If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. That's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast, and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. 
Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you, and if you have the means, please join my Patreon community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on patreon.com slash regenerative agriculture or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast.